uh, what we recommend you to do. So now you can really relax. There won't be any, there won't be any exercise sessions. The exercise leads can relax. Expert helpers can relax. But please still stay stay with us until the end because we also want to thank you for your work. And the best way to to watch this session is to really watch us live code. So together with Luca, we will do some live coding in front of you. Hopefully, also some improv. And it will be just really stressful for us. But you can you can sit back and relax. And please participate via HackMD. So the best way to watch on half of your screen, keep the Twitch open. On the other half of the screen, keep the HackMD open and ask us tons of questions and give us suggestions. And we will try to do what you tell us uh, to do. Good. Who, who and how should we present? Who should type? Who should talk? We were thinking about rolling a die. Yeah, we're having fun. Yes. Yeah. I just coded it, so maybe you want to take the keyboard. Or... Okay, so I will do the, I will do some, some coding here, and Luca will give me tips, and hopefully you all will give me tips, and I will hopefully not make too many typos. So let's get started. We, we want to talk about modular code development, and. We have tr we have given this lesson in multiple formats. There is also a slide slide deck which we will, we will not show, just that you know that it exists. You can have a look. It we had a feeling it was maybe a little bit too theoretical. We feel it it's more fun if we show modular code development as it happens. We will really focus on the why, not so much on the how, and I think we will do the development in Python. But we will keep it simple. I know that many of you don't read or write Python, but we will try to see through it. We will try to focus on the on the process, on the thinking, not so much on the language. We have put now, so here when I zoom in, we have put into the HackMD a few starting questions to get us to get to get this going. And I will also open the HackMD on my side. Just a sec, I need to, in my other secret browser, I need to switch that to view. I'll be there in a moment. But the three questions that we ask you are, what does modular code development mean to you? And what best practices can you recommend uh, to arrive at a well-structured modular code in your favorite programming language? And what do you know now that you wish somebody told you earlier? So if you could travel back in time and give your past self some tips, what would it be? And I will yeah. find these questions and also have a look at what, what's going happening here. Here we have them. And also look up, please help me. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think there are very nice answers. Like to the questions. Yeah, some people haven't heard of modular code, but I think it's good because it means they will learn something new today, hopefully. So, so what does it mean for you? For, yeah. for me, for me, me? Yeah. Oh, what it means for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should also add the answer and I will add it. Oh, what it really means for me practically is that I can copy paste a function from one project to another project and it will still work or a module or I can copy paste something from one one Jupyter notebook to another Jupyter notebook and it still does does the same thing that's what it means to me reusability and hopefully we will experience it we will start with a very simple project and all projects start very simple but then it will grow and it will become more complicated and then we will try to keep it manageable. Here, smaller modules, isolate problems, or avoiding code repetition, because that, that can lead to improving one part, but forgetting to improve the other part. What best practices can we recommend in different programming languages? And please add more suggestions here. 
uh, we will hopefully also see that um, in different programming languages, it's still the same ideas. The same ideas are valid, whether it's Python or, or MATLAB or R. So there is object-oriented object -oriented programming, functional programming, pure functions. We will see that, hopefully we'll experience that. What is a pure function? A function without side effects. Um, don't repeat yourself. This is now very, very um, geared towards Python. Hopefully we also see something for other languages. This question I really love. Um, um, Richard taught me this question. What do you know now that you wish somebody told you earlier? Yes, everybody is still web searching and that's that's okay. There's nothing wrong. We don't have to memorize everything. We need to know where to find it. Uh, I'm looking for things on a weekly basis that I, that I use on a weekly basis. Unit tests, making tests part of the, of the process, stack overflow. What would, what would we do without? Starting small, starting simple. Then there are, very, there are tools like integrated development environments that are here to help us. The power of an editor. We spend quite a few days, a few hours every week inside, an, inside a code editor. So choose, choose the one that you like best, choose the one that fits you. Spend some time learning it well, it will pay off. Code readability. This is a very good point because we write codes. We think that we write them for computers, but really we write them mostly for humans. I think we spend more time trying to understand the code than actually running it on a, on a processor. Are we ready to jump in and start some coding? Yeah, I think we are. Yes, here we have some additional questions. They are also fun to think about, but I didn't put them into the HackMD, no problem. I want to show you what, what we want to learn in the next 45 minutes. We want to learn without being too, too theoretical. We want to learn about pure functions, what they are. And these are functions that have no side effects that give the same, if I give it the same input, it will produce the same output. And we want to learn how can we limit these side effects that I, I modify something in one part of the code and suddenly something in the, another part of the code starts breaking. There is the Zen of Python, which is a couple of recommendations of how to, what to do with Python code, but, but I think it's not only, it's valid for any, any language. And we will, we will motivate single purpose functions. Last week we talked about single purpose commits and single purpose branches. And now we will have single purpose functions and single purpose modules. Not trying to, if you have a function that where the documentation says this function can do this and this and that or that unless something else, then it's already too complicated. So single purpose. What is our task? Yeah, what, what do I need to do in the next hour? It's, we, we thought it would be fun to start with, with a simple example. And we will start with a CSV file. These are commerce separated values. It's a table of temperatures recorded in close to Helsinki in 2019. And our, uh, let me have a look how this data looks. It's on, it's on GitHub. GitHub renders it as a table. So for every, I don't know, every hour it records temperature in centigrade. And this is now rendered as a nice table. The actual file, if I click on raw, looks like it's a comma separated list. So this is my input data. And my task was, our initial goal is we want to plot this data, 25 measurements or 25 hours, and we want to do some statistics. <clears throat> and this, we will keep the statistics really simple, arithmetic mean. What I would like all of you to imagine is that 
let's imagine it's a bit more complicated, but we will demonstrate it with a simple example. So simple data, simple statistics, and later we plot it. So let me take a breather here so that I also see the hack and D. Oh yeah, I forgot to say something. Sorry for that. Well, I, I emphasize that it's really the best way to do this is to watch and not type along because then you can type in, in the HackMD. So please do HackMD along. But still we will very roughly, like we don't know what will happen, but we will very roughly follow steps and they are here in the instructor guide. So if you then later want to retrace what did we do and why did we do it, you can find it in this instructor guide. We will not follow it precisely. So you can you can later either watch the video or um, read up here. But back to back to the task. So my task was read the data, do some statistics, plot it, and let's imagine that on Stack Overflow, I found an example that does it does something similar. So we we found this on Stack Overflow, and then we will take it. Um, I often take something from Stack Overflow, and first I make it work. And then later I adapt it to what I needed to do. How do you get started generally? Do you start in the terminal, in the editor, in a notebook? What is your workflow like when you need to start tackling a problem? Where where do you start generally? Hmm. I often start inside the terminal, but this could also be a really good example to start in a notebook. Um, because reading data, doing statistics, plotting, it's a really, really good notebook use case. What we could also try is that we start in a notebook and if we then realize that we grew out of it and it doesn't fit anymore, then we move into the, into the command line. And it could also be a good way to discuss when is a notebook not a good fit anymore. Yeah. Should we start in a notebook? Yeah, I think here we have some plots, so it can be nice to have embedded code and plots. What yeah, do you think? Good. Yeah, so good. So generally how I get started, if I need to make plots to prototype, like dirty prototyping, I start in a notebook so that I see the plots and then at some point I move out of it. Mm -hmm. the terminal yeah. editor. Let's do that. So my first step would have been, before I do anything, I create a new folder, live example. And personally, before I do anything, I like to initialize a repository, get in it. And then I can stage and commit my steps and go back if I mess up and I have a trace of what I did. So that's my step number one. But then step number two will be, we need to fetch that data and it's on GitHub and the link was there. And the way I would download it, I mean, there are many ways to download it. I could maybe, is there some download button? What I would have done is I would click on raw because then I see the actual raw file and I copy that address. And then you can use wget or curl. So these are tools to, oh, this is something from before. Um, these are tools to fetch data directly into the, in, in the terminal. So the download, what do I have? I have now this extra file, git status. It doesn't know what it is. We remember from last week that now good, good move now would be to stage it and, get, and commit it. Often when I do exploratory work, I don't even commit. I just stage it because already by staging, I can come back. But let's do this now a little bit nicer. We commit, oops, minus M, saving the data. I have it. Now let me open up a Jupyter notebook. And I will need to make sure that I have the browsers here arranged in a nice way. How was that again? Jupyter, Jupyter Lab. What I like to do is I started with no browser because then I can decide in which browser I open it up and it, it doesn't just open some, some of my browsers. Okay, fingers crossed. It gives me this address and I can click and I'll open it up, up here. Finger crossed uh, describes 
pre pretty well my state of mind when, when, when I'm actually dabbing a code, while well, I dev code, like, yeah, no, finger crossed that. This is such an optimistic profession that we work in. Hmm. I will move this a little bit away because we will not be so much interested in the terminal for a while. We will be interested in the in the notebook. I will start a new one. I will move this away. First thing I do, I rename it. I don't want it to be called untitled. What's a good name? Temperatures. I don't know. Helsinki weather in November. And now we copy pasted that code from Stack Overflow. And here the goal is not that we understand everything here. Um, I'm importing a couple of modules written by somebody else for data processing and for plotting. We read a data file. From the data file, I take all the temperatures. Then we compute some statistics. And then I'm plotting the result. And shift enter. And when I tried it last night late, it actually didn't plot anything. And I wasn't really sure why, but I realized that if I commented this out, it did plot. So this is some leftover. Now I get a yeah. plot. Okay, just quick look at what the hack and D is suggesting me to do. We got a plot. It's looks somehow right. So the temperature was around zero. There are no there are no units and there is no axis annotations. Yeah. That's not good. Yeah. What Maybe is the that. pandas doing? Someone is curious. What is pandas doing? Except having a cute name. What is the function of pandas? Pandas is one of the go-to libraries in Python to do to work with data frames, so working with tabular data, sorting, filtering, um, processing data. Here I'm using pandas because I was a bit lazy or, or the person where I copied it from, from Stack Overflow because pandas has a really convenient function to read, read a CSV file directly into, into a data frame. So in here, I could have a look what is inside the data. Maybe we can do that, why not? What is inside the data that we read here? There is a there is a data frame. There is a whole table of values. It doesn't print everything. Well, twenty four. It prints me a twenty four values. Oh yeah, why? Because I asked only for not twenty five. Because I only asked for twenty five. That's why. Otherwise, it would give me all of it. And then I extract temperatures and some statistics and we plot. I should do, before we move on, I should do two things which every supervisor will tell me to do. Please add some axis annotation. And I will do that. We don't need to know how. X label measurements. And this is, we will later realize that this is maybe not even the best way to do that, but it will work. This unit. And if I rerun it, maybe I will see something. Yeah, it looks a little bit nicer. Yeah. That's good. Now our task. Okay, we are half past the hour. Very good. Our task now. We, I got this to work, but now we get a new task. The further goal is I got it to working now for twenty-five measurements. Now my task changed. We also want to see the first 100 measurements and the first 500 measurements in two additional plots. And what we would like to hear from you, how would you tackle this problem? How would you now go from 25 to 100 to 500? And then as we go along, we will improve things. Why is this still untitled here? Yeah. OK, here I have the name. Maybe because I didn't save. So while while you give me some ideas on HackMD, I will save this. What I might also want to do in the terminal is go in 
git add git commit because this already looks somehow working. So good to save it. What we could also do is enable the git integration and stage and commit here from the notebook. I will now not do it, not to distract too much. So I want one good suggestion on HackMD. How about creating a function? A function that can take um, that can take uh, where I can make this variable. Because one thing I could try to do is, well, I could just copy paste this um, three times. And here I could have 25, and here I could have 100, and here I could have 500. But that would not be very maintainable because what if I later find that there was a mistake and I fix it up here, but I forget to fix it down here. So code duplication is often, sometimes it's okay. This, this, this time it may be not be the best way. So let me get rid of that again. Um, create a function that is parameter the number of measurements. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's do that. Should we put the whole thing into the function? Maybe. Maybe. What, 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 what could be the advantages and disadvantages of that? Maybe it's, it's less functions, but is it good uh, to have yeah. everything in one function? So to explain what, what I'm asking here is that I could put everything into, into a function called do it, or I don't know, read, uh, compute, and plot. And I could give it a argument and measurements. And now I need to indent everything and I don't know how to do that in a notebook. In my editor, I could just indent everything automatically, but I could do this. But what if, for example, my data is in a different unit of measure? So I just want to change the label. Yes. If I have everything in one function, then if I just yeah. want to change one label, how would you approach that problem? Would you make everything a parameter in that function so that X label is a parameter, Y label is a parameter, number of measurements is a parameter, or what would you do? Mm. So the questions here, is it a good idea to put everything into a function? I'm not sure because already here I see that it's a function that does this and this and also that. It tells me, well, maybe I want a little bit smaller functions because in another project of mine, I would like to reuse just the statistics or just the plotting. And I could, about the second question, if I want to now make it really configurable and generic, I would have to pass in all these arguments X label, Y label, data file, how many measurements, what is the file name, and it can get a little bit long. So if I see many, many, many arguments, maybe also I want to split things up. So what I would like to do is I would like to maybe not put everything into one function. I would I would I would put the the reading into a function, the plotting into a function, and the the statistics into a function. Should we try that? Yeah, let's try. Okay, just too much sun here. Okay. And Luca has an eye on, on the hack and D. I'm also trying yeah. to look at it, but multitasking a little bit here. So reading data from file, let's make it a function, read data. And I will give it file name. File name goes in. Also notice that now that I created this function, well, I still need to call it. Why is this? Why did? Oh, hang on, maybe. Oh, okay. It wants four spaces. Good. A function should read something and return something. Often, return temperatures. I defined it. Later, I can call the function. So temperatures equals this thing. And instead of file name, it's now called temperature CSV. And this is wrong here because I shouldn't have that. I should have file name. 
and we could make it more general because instead of file name, maybe I should also give what do I want to extract. What if I want something else than the temperature? But let, let's keep it for a, for a while. Also, notice now that I defined the function. I don't really need this anymore. Still, a good idea to have a doc string. But it's somehow self explanatory what this does. I will do the same thing for compute statistics. Compute stat and what will it be? It will get some temperatures. I will make it a little bit, this is not super what I'm doing here, but it will still work surprisingly. Return mean, and then we have a function called plot result. And I'm typing here in Python, but if if Python is not your language, hopefully you still rec you recognize these, what, what we are doing here. Um, maybe you have been through a similar process in your language. Create plot. Ah, plot, plot data. And what, what should you get? It should get maybe file name, plot name, figure name. Naming is hard. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. So instead yeah, of this, should, it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be soon a run and make sure that this still works and we haven't created yeah. the, the pipeline that we created is not a broken one. Yes, let's do that. I will. Yeah. I, I also need to actually use it. So how was that? We compute temperatures, then mean equals compute stats, and then I call the plot data. Does that still, it's, it will still work, I think. Yeah. What was it called, 20? Yeah, the saving is not so important here, but it still saves it to the hard drive. Later, I want to have them only saved. PNG. Let's, let me test whether this is working. Yeah, yeah it's still working. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it can be a little bit somebody's... Hmm. Hmm. But what if, uh, for example, uh, because the NUMA measurements now is outside the function and uh, it's hard coded there, someone is suggesting that should be a variable in the read the data function. What do you think? What is the downside in this situation? Like if I have it as a constant outside the function, what, what could possibly go wrong? What could go wrong? Yeah, it's a very good question and a very good suggestion because this code works a little bit to my surprise and it works only because I'm lucky that I have defined some of these variables that I'm using inside a function, I have def defined them earlier. And now I come back to what does modular code development mean to me? It means to me that now in my other notebook, in my other project, I would like to use this. I would like to use this function to read some data. I don't want to reinvent it. But when you copy paste this function into your other project, it will not work because it will complain that it doesn't know none measurements. This is undefined. This is not a pure function. This function does not always do the same thing if I give it the same input. It, it, this is function is side effects. It depends on stuff defined outside. So this was a very good idea. I will now do this. And one way, wait a moment, will that work? I think one way to see that, let's see. I think one thing I would try, I would try this, to not have anything defined before I have any functions defined. And let's move that also to the inside the function here. So what I like to have in any language, personally, so that's a personal opinion here, I like to have almost everything inside some function. Here I have a bit of code outside. Let's see whether this still works. It still works, but it's a Python thing. Yeah, I think because since you have already run the kernel for a while, yes. it's tested the new measurements, so it's you cannot uncreate it once it's created the variable. But actually, we can, and now we remember. Yeah, what, we can. Who was it? Tor or somebody taught us that? Oh, it's a really good idea to before I save the notebook, 
before I show you how the people run all cells or even restart the kernel. This is like rebooting the, the notebook. Yes. And now my CPU is running. Why is it still working? <laughs> I code works and I have no idea why. Um, yeah, this is this is the classic debugging. Yeah, step I number think one, why is it not working? Step number two, hmm. step number three, why is it, one, work? is it ever working? <laughs> I think because you are still defining uh, the variable the measurements before you call the function. So you define yes. the function, but then you don't call it yet. And then you call it after you have created new measurements. So I think it will check for the existence of that variable only when you call it and not at definition. Yeah, let's do this. A number of measurements. I suddenly changed my mind. I didn't know that these functions are have side effects. Boom, now what? Yeah, I got a plot. Oh yeah, because I'm not sure why. Because I think but because it still exists from before, probably. Because it got some correct data, but I got an error message. So you, we got a new problem and th that is something was undefined. It Did crashed somewhere. Really good idea here to pass it in measurements. Anything else? Yeah, and maybe, maybe what I'm reading is actually, well, in this case, it is temperatures. So even better would be this would be even even much better read data temperatures this and 25 yeah. let's even keep this completely undefined and here instead i do Column. This is even more general because what if I read something else from the pictures? Column results. Oh, I can even say this. Return. This is nicer. Compute plus temperatures. Same thing. Same problem here. Number of measurements and plot data. Figure name. We should actually pass in what is the data. It shouldn't be. It doesn't have to be just temperatures. And mean, this is better. But now I change my mind again. It should. It's better if this is a bit variable. Temperatures, not measurements. And here, what is this expect? It's a file name, the data, 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 mean. Does it work? Data. Where? What does it mean? Oh, because I'm printing this uh, unrelated oh, yeah. thing. Sorry for that. Let's so I think the error is in the other variable. So I there think, was no error. Hmm. Yeah. And what do you think? Because since now you have a lot of functions in that cell, is it more readable if it's uh, each definition in its own cell? Or what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Because then it's also easier to copy paste. So I don't, I'm, I don't know how I can split this into different cells. But what I often do is that in let me do it a bit more pedestrian here. This is, this is what I would actually do. I would have in one cell on top the imports. Then let's have one cell for, oops, let's not lose the code. Um, one cell for the reading. What do I get to use here? B, B. One for the reading, one for the statistics, one for the plotting. Okay, this is not the nicest way of doing it. Like this, I would probably do organize it. And now let's do the good thing again, run all cells. 
from top to bottom. We didn't ever yeah. produce something. And now back to our problem, we wanted to have not only 25, but we wanted to have yeah. more than, and now we can do that easily yeah. for num measurements. But, mm -hmm. What about the compute stats? So you are, oh, not as wrong. Uh, with the, uh, in the compute stats, uh, we are giving temperatures and number of measurements. Uh, but the, so you are taking the mean, uh, so you are summing all the values in the temperature and dividing by the external variable num measurements. But what if the user like uh, is very tired and gives the wrong number of measurements to that function? Mm. Would it be more robust if you use the length of the vector? Good idea. We don't need even this. We don't need that because we know we divide by the number of elements. Compute starts. Where do I use it? Actually, let let me just. I want to see an error also. Let me run this thing. Yeah. What did I do now wrong? How do we read it? I read it from bottom up. Here there is something. What was the problem? Compute stats takes one positional argument, but I gave two. It expects one, but I gave two. Where? Where I called it here. So that I don't need. Run all cells. Also, someone in Hackend is uh, kindly informing us. Oh no, no, yeah, that the control shift plus, or I think it's control shift minus to split a cell. Let's test it out. See what happens if I do here. Control shift plus. Uh, so I'm not sure because it's control plus shift plus dash. So, but there's a, a space between the plus and the dash. So I actually not sure how to read it. But we can try both control shift plus and control shift minus. Hmm. Okay, now we're getting this ambiguation. It's control shift minus. Control. control. Shift minus, yeah, yeah, okay, good. Yeah. What if you have the cursor in the middle of the cell? Does it split at that point? Or? Control shift minus, yes, yeah, cool. oh, excellent. I'll go, I'll go back though, <laughs> maybe like this, yeah. yes, good. I control Z, that's very cool. And I think now I now it makes again sense why we had this PLT, does it? Oh, CLF, because now I get all the three figures into one. Oh, it doesn't do it. This used to work a few months ago. But it it now plots everything. What does it do? No, it, it plots the last one. And it also does some weird things because it puts three means into the same figure. So it almost works. We have now 10 minutes before the hour. We also want to take a break. I'm thinking, just checking when is a good time for a break, should I? And what is the problem here? Uh, um, is it, is since does uh, uh, Python by default always create a new figure when you call the plot data function or does it plot on top of that? Let's see what because it yeah. I would expect that when if you take different measurements, the plot would still be the same because it would be on top of each other's and yes. then you would get the different means. Yeah. So this worked. Thanks for the anonymous tip from HackMD. This was the solution, plot show. Good. We got we got the three figures. And what are the next possible steps? We can think a little bit about it. This is already not too bad here. Um, what I suggest is that we take a break. We collect more ideas. And after the break, what we can try is that we can, we can try to add some tests. Maybe we'll realize that this is a good moment then to to move on to, to the command line once we start adding tests. We can discuss a bit, are these functions now more reusable? I think they are more reusable. There is still some improvements we can do. And we can talk about tests. 
we can also talk about command line interface. We can think, would it be maybe maybe the thing to take with you into the break is what if what if I want to create now many many plots, a hundred figures instead of three? Yeah. Let's do that. Ten minutes. We would be back. Uh, three minutes past the hour, and then resume. And we are back. Welcome back from the break. We have 15 minutes left in this session. In these 15 minutes, together with Luca, we will try to do a few more things here based on your questions and suggestions. And then we will conclude the workshop with a summary and outro session. So 15 more minutes. Before we move on and before I ask Luca what to do next, I want to show that there were two benefits of organizing my code into smaller units. One benefit is that I now have these building blocks, which hopefully I can reuse in my next project or my next notebook. The other advantage is that it helps also reading and understanding. Because now when I come into somebody else's project or into my own project in a couple of weeks, I don't have to understand everything. I would start here. And I get really a high level overview. Uh -huh. we, we read the data, it's, we compute some statistics, we plot it. And then if I want to know more, I can look into the functions. And I typically look at what goes into a function, then some magic happens inside, and what goes out. But I first look at what, what comes in, what goes out. And I look at the documentation. And then if I want to really know more, I can read what is happening inside the function. But it they can help me hiding away the details that I don't want to understand every single time. What should I do next? What, what is the next step that what would you do now with this? Yeah, so now we start to have uh, a lot of functions here and uh, they're all pretty generic. Uh, like we have to compute statistics to plot data. Mm -hmm. And they are all coupled together in the same notebook. But what if in a, I need only to compute some statistics in a different project, for example, mm -hmm. or I just need to plot some data? Mm -hmm. So now I only have one notebook, but can I uh, scatter these in different files and have like separate modules for each mm -hmm. or separate in different modules? What do you think? Good idea. How, how would you do that? So what will be the next step? Yeah. To yeah. That. Yeah. I think uh, at this point uh, I would probably move to an editor, and I would uh, mm -hmm. switch from a prototyping mode to packaging mode. So now I have mm -hmm. some uh, skeleton. Let's say, okay, I can do this. I can do that. But now I would be able. I would like to be able to collect from, for example, from from another script, and not just from a Jupyter notebook with the definition there. Yes. So I would uh, probably open an editor. And then if I have already in mind that I want to release the package as a package, for example, in pip or similar, I would uh, use some template because I wouldn't know how to create the whole structure from scratches by memory. So I would use some template from the model and then I would start uh, putting the functions in the model and start putting the meat around the bones, so to speak, and fill the, that. Let's do that. Yeah. So this also for me would be the moment. So this is a nice notebook. I could put it on GitHub. We could put it on Binder. But this is typically the moment when I want to maybe move to the editor. I might think about adding a test. Uh, once I want to split it into several files, then I'm moving over to the editor. And there are now. Well, maybe first step, let me save it. Let's save our good work. I didn't commit it yet. I will do that in a moment. There are tools that help me to convert a notebook into a, into a Python file. One thing I want to mention, how was it? MB convert, notebook convert. So this is one file. MB convert, read the docs.io. It can convert notebooks to other things. And uh, someone in the audience is suggesting to use Jupyter and be convert dash dash to Python. Uh -huh. So 
that's interesting. I also want to show another way that I found, I think, yesterday, and that is up here. I can do directly on fail file, save and export notebook as. Maybe that's the same thing. But here I can save it as executable script. I think that's what I want. Yeah, I think. Saving. I'll put it into, into the right folder where we are. Where are we right now? In course, for live example, I'm saving. So I saved the file. Let's see whether this worked. I will close this. Close. Let's also stop the notebook. Maybe a nice way is to do this shut down. I want to do that, yes. Now I can move this out of my way. What happened down here in Git status? I got a couple of new things. There are these images. I will not attempt to get they are generated. All of these I could add to Git ignore. What I'm really interested in putting to Git is the notebook. Git add notebook. I also got this new file which is exported. I will stage it as well. And I will now open it in my editor. Let's see what we see there. It, it, is, a, it is a Python file. There are all the cells. It, it created the cell number as it comments. Yeah, I don't need this anymore. I can get rid of these things. And what I would do now, we have really less than 10 minutes left. I I would even I would not even leave this. So this is a Python file that I could run with Python and the file name. And it would hopefully do the same thing. In this case, I will not need this anymore because I don't need to see these images. I want to save them to my hard drive. And now what Luca wanted to do is that we split this into reusable modules that I can import. What, which function should I move into a module? Which of these three? I mean, eventually I want to do maybe for all of them, but where should I start? Yeah, I think maybe you could start from the computer stats into a general module for computing uh, statistical measurements for weather data, for example, could be a yep. start with the mean and then grow on top of it and then different functionalities, like if you want to compute median or other indicators. Or, yes, uh, I will save it. So let me, let me just verify that this is still working. Python has a key weather.py. It's not crashing, that's already good. Git status. I'm happy with that it's not crashing. I will stage it. Let's do the let's let's do something good and put this into Git ignore. This file should be ignored. What do you think about the CSV file? Would you also ignore data and have in a separate repository or would you keep them with the code? Or how would you handle the data? Here I would keep it in my repository. Yeah. Um, because then it's also easier for the next person to have it running. And unless this is gigabytes and terabytes of data, yeah. then, then I would have that in a separate data archive and import it directly from the web. Good. The next, step, next thing I would do is I wanted to create this statistics package. I, will, I think I will just copy it for the moment. Statistics. In now, let me edit the statistics package. In the statistics, I don't need. I don't need any of that. I just want to keep that compute stats. And later, I would have some other things. I will have there will be other statistics, compute, media, yeah. and so on. Maybe the first one would be called the compute mean. What do you think? Oh, yes, much better name. It's 
much better. Good. Then I save it. And you can see that I use git status every five minutes. I stage the file. And now that I, in my Helsinki weather, I don't need to define this function anymore. I don't need it anymore. I can delete it. But, and it was not called compute stats. It was compute, compute mean. But where is that compute mean? Where is this function now? Now I need, now I need to import it. Import, or I can say from statistics, statistics import compute mean. That's one way. Alternatively, I could say, so here from this module, which I created, which is in a separate file, I'm importing just this function. Alternatively, I could say import statistics. I can't type it. And I could say, so it's different according to taste style. Both will do the same thing. Which one would you prefer? Uh, maybe uh, the, since the statistics has only the compute mean at the moment, I would probably go for the first one, probably, I guess. Yeah. But maybe if I had uh, also, if I use uh, several modules, uh, like I have, I don't know, some statistics and some uh, weird statistics module, if both export the function called compute mean, then I would probably use uh, the other one so that I can disambiguate uh, with the name of the module and avoid collisions, mm. probably. Yeah. So this, I guess let's see whether this is working. Yep, it's working. And this way we could, I could organize plotting and read data input output into several modules. These modules can then also be imported in a Jupyter notebook. So this can be another way of not repeating the same code from notebook to notebook to notebook. Now we are almost out of time. So maybe we will, I want to mention that there would be one more thing that I would like to do, but I, maybe I will not show it, but I want to point you to it. And that is the thing that I would now do as a, as a next step is to add a command line interface. I would like to modify my script so that I, if I want suddenly now 300 measurements or 350, that I don't have to go into the file and change it here. I would like to be able that the user um, provides this from the outside. And maybe Would you I write the here. tests uh, for the statistics also? Yeah, test, good idea. How Should we do the tests? Should we do a command line interface? We have like really two minutes left. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we have time for making a polling hack MD, but um, maybe Both? we both don't. are in our like solution. Yeah. Don't worry about me for the outro. It can be shorter. Okay. If you want five minutes, go ahead. Cool. All right. We'll use five minutes yeah. no more. Thanks. Yeah. And Luca tells me what to do. Is it testing? Testing is a good uh, thing, huh? Yeah, let's go. It's always good to have tests. Good. Let's add a test. And what did we learn from what did we learn from the previous episode? I would add the test. I personally like to add the test close to the function because then it can help me. I can use it as a documentation because then if I don't really understand what is happening inside the function, I can look at the test. And we learned that in PyTest, we, in PyTest will run any function that starts with test underscore. Here, what should I do? Uh, uh, I maybe you want some, Maybe you want to take a simple vector like with one, two, three, and check the mean of that. Please. One, two, three. Let's make it a bit difficult with 14 point numbers. Yeah. And I want to check. So the result is compute mean from the example vector. And I want to compare it to 
make sure assert, make sure that the result equals it's probably wrong here but I'll, I will try that anyway what is it one plus two plus three plus four mm -hmm. is ten divided by four 2.5 okay. this is not so great because in tests whenever you compare floating point as we learned earlier today this is not very robust Should you have this equal equal by the way Result oh. equal equal yeah. yes thank you so this might or might not might not work and now we remember that there was this called pytest approx and i'm asking the internet how did that work again pytest approx it explains a bit how that works and why that works. That's what I want to do. I think in this specific case, it would work because you have only integers and uh, fractions of two, like integers and half. And so yeah. those are exactly representable as floating point numbers. Yeah. So it would be, but this is, I think, more robust, more nice, future proof. Now, if I run this, it will actually complain because it doesn't know where this approx come from. I need to import it also from PyTest import approx and let's quit git status, git add this and this. I got something new that should go into dot git ignore. And how did I run this thing now? By test. And you can see that there is a red color because it doesn't, I didn't install it. I got some error message. The important thing is that I don't have PyTest installed because I should have activated con uh, the code refiner environment. But now I'm not in the code refiner environment. What would I do next? I personally would create a file called requirements.txt or environment YAML. And here I document all the dependencies that I need. This project needs PyTest. And I could give it a specific version. Here I, I just want the latest one. And then what I often do is when I need a new dependency, I first document it. I want to have this file in my Git repository and then I install from it. And now I need to create a virtual environment. Python. Alternatively, it could be a conda environment. I need to activate it. And now I install from what I like to do is I like to install from, from the file. Then whatever I need, I have it already documented. And now I have PyTest available and I can do, I can test it. It passed. It passed. And the next thing I will do, and I will not show it because we are out of time, I would actually try to introduce an error into the code and I would verify that then the test complains. Yeah. Good. What I recommend you to do is think about it, have a look at this. There is one thing that we left out and it was the command line interface. How to do it and why to do it, it's in this, in these, um, Let's zoom out. It's all here in the instructor guide. And there we also motivate all these steps and all the steps that we've shown, they are there. Thanks so much for watching, listening. Luca, thanks so much for the suggestions. And I think I should give back the, the screen and the microphone to Richard to wrap up the, the workshop.